Welcome back. So I did get myself an Amiga CD32, which allegedly was the first real 32-bit console in the world. Video game called so that is. Sorry for the sound, the 3D printer is running in the back. Uh, printing that cover here. I paid 210 euros, no, 215 euros. And it's just the blank console. No power supply, no controller, no nothing. These things go with a controller and a power supply for about four to five hundred euros. I also um, won an auction on some controllers. One original CD32 controller and one Honeybee controller, which is a, a third party controller, which should come in today or tomorrow. So it will make it, 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 will make it into this video. I will give you a rundown of the specs of this thing in a minute. In a nutshell, it's a stripped down Amiga 1200 with a CD ROM drive. And if you populate this expansion port, you can actually make or turn this into a, a real Amiga 1200. It's untested as always on eBay. And you know what that means. We will open it up. We will take a look inside as we always do. And uh, yeah, we have to come up with solutions for power and for control and for video. Let's take a closer look at this. Um, if you take a look at this, you can open this up. It's just a handle mechanism here, which you have to do by hand. It's a little scratched. But all in all, it's in pretty good condition. It's dusty and dirty, but it's, it's doable. You have a reset switch here, something the Amiga never managed to get. You have a volume control, which is a bit scratchy. You have a headphone jack. Then if you turn to this side, you have nothing. If you turn it to the back, you have your on-off switch, which I would bet is the original C64 power switch. You have the expansion connector with nothing inside. And I assume there was something in th inside here, but these things are crazy expensive. So I assume the seller just took it out and sold it separately. We have the power connector, which I read is the same power brick as on the 1542. I'm not sure about that. I will have to check that closer. We have an uh, RF out. We have an S video out, which is nice. Also the Amiga never managed. And we have component plus sound. And on the side, we have two joystick ports, one for the controller one for controller and mouse, so mouse works. And we have this auxiliary port, which I think can actually connect to a keyboard, but I'm not sure. So I have to check what this auxiliary port does. On the back side, which is interesting, you have this here. And this looks, if you turn it like this, it looks like you could hang this on the wall. And you have the same up here if you remove the feet. I'm pretty sure you could hang this on the wall if you would like to. Doesn't make sense, but you, you could. Yeah, I have no games whatsoever for this, which will make it pretty interesting to test it. But first, uh, let me give you a rundown of the specs and then I will open this up and we will take a look inside. By the way, the seller said there's some battery damage on the port. You can see that here it's a bit greenish from the clock battery, but my research said there's no clock battery inside this. so. I don't know. Let's see. Let's take a look at the specs and then open it up. The CD32, codenamed Spellbound, was a gaming console developed by Commodore International based on the Amiga 1200. It had a CD-ROM and it was the official successor to the CD-TV. It was released for about $400 in Europe on September 16, 1993 and later in Australia, Brazil and in Canada. It was the first gaming console in the European market with a real 32-bit architecture and was intended to compete with Philips CDI. It was discontinued eight months later in April of 1994. Due to an overdue royalty payment from Commodore to Catrack, the CD32 never made it officially to the US and the already produced consoles were made in the manufacturing facility in the Philippines until they were later sold for as cheap as $15. The CD32 sold around 100,000 units in Europe alone, not enough to keep an already struggling Commodore from filing bankruptcy. 
there were eight game titles in total at launch. Ultimately, very few exclusive titles were released on the CD32 and most games were conversions from Amiga 1200 or even Amiga 500 titles. There's no copy protection or regional coding on the CDs, so you can burn them yourself. The only problem is that you would need a single or double speed CD burner and the right CDR media since the CD32's CD drive is super picky. Technically, the Amiga 1200, on which the CD32 was based on, was reduced to the essentials for gaming and supplemented with a CD drive. However, through a slot at the back, the CD32 could be expanded into a fully fledged Amiga or alternatively into the video CD player. These things, these expansion packs, are super, super expensive right now. The CD32 used a special custom chip called a Kiko instead of the Gale system controller used in the A1200, which was intended to simplify PC conversions of 3D games and enable more complex 3D graphics. It came with a power supply, an RF cable, a horrible controller and at its release date the pack in games Oscar and Diggers. Later packs contain more games. Technically the CD32 had a Motorola 68020 with 14.18 MHz in the PAL version or 14.28 MHz in the NTST version. It had two Macs of chip RAM, a 1 Mac ROM with Kickstarter 3.1 and 1 KB of flash ROM for saving games since there was no disk drive. It also used the AG8 chipset from the 1200 but with the Akiko chip instead of the Gale chip. It had a double speed CD-ROM with CD audio support and even a built-in CD audio player. It had the Akiko custom chip instead of the Gale chip which featured 24-bit colors which amounted to 16.7 million colors. The resolution was up to 1280 by 512 interlaced and it had four 8-bit audio channels. IO-wise it featured an S-Video Out a classic 4-pin mini DIN, composite out via RCA, RF out, audio out via two RCA ports or the 3.5 mm stereo jack which is on top of the console. It had two mouse slash joypad ports, the classic D sub 9, an RS232 serial aux port which was for the keyboard which is a 6-pin mini DIN and uh, you could also attach other stuff to that. Not sure what the other stuff for that was. And it had the infamous 182-pin expansion socket for the MPEG decoder and the SX1 and SX32 expansion packs, which technically turned it into a 68 or 30 Amiga 1200. So to open it up, we have a few screws, uh, not many. One, two, three, four, five. And we have this screw here and we have a screw here. Not sure what that does. So let me take this out first because this is just hanging in there. There's nothing to do. And these screws are super loose. So I assume someone was in here. I hope there was no attempt to repair this because that makes it so much harder to repair stuff when someone else already tried to. So this should be all the screws. Let's see if this comes off and it actually, actually does. Okay, so and here's our first look inside the CD32. There's something loose here, which I assume <laughs> This is classic Commodore style. Uh, is to ground this, and this just touches the shield here. Oh, there's some pretty hefty rust here. So this thing definitely did get wet. And here you can see the hanging tabs. Oh, there's a screw actually here. This doesn't look good. Looks like looks like rust under this cover here, which is not good. Yeah. So let's pull this ribbon cable here to disconnect the drive. Yep, can. Another connector right here. 
like this. And this is keyed, so no worries here. So here's the CD-ROM drive. This is a control board on top, and we have the mechanism there. You can see there's quite the stuff inside there. Camera focus. Yeah, we will take a look at this in a minute. So, yeah, it is pretty dusty. Let's see, we have to lift these tabs and we have, if I say, see this correctly, two screws, no, three screws holding this in. So let's remove the screws first and that should give us the whole board because I don't see any other screws here to hold this in, but maybe under the cover there's more. Nope, that gives us the whole board. And yes, there is, oh, there's rust. And I hope it's just on the shielding. Doesn't look like someone opened this because the tabs are nicely bent down. So this has to be cleaned. So there's some rust over here. And there's some rust over here. I think that can be, can be saved. Okay, so let's open this surprise package off and what do we have well 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 the board looks to be in surprisingly good condition you have the kickstart ROM over here which should be a 3.1 yeah it says here and we have a bit of rust on the power switch not sure how the connector the power connector got its greenish tint We'll take a look at this in a minute. Let's take out the board and check from the underside. I hope the rust didn't get to it. No, it looks good. Whoa, that is, that is a great relief. There's a bit of rust here on the ground plane and a bit of rust here where nothing is connected. So, hey, I think we are good. I think this could actually work. Caps here look okay. These caps look okay. I'm still going to change them all out and recap the board. Not sure if I do this before I test it or after I test it. We will see. Yeah, so that, that looks very, very promising. I'm very glad to see this because it means I can save this board. Probably. Most probably. Okay, nice. Um, so let me clean this all out and then we will take a closer look at the board and I will recap the board and these, there are a lot of caps. There are a lot of caps. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 26 caps, electrolytic caps and then the three bigger caps here. Okay, I have my work cut out for me. Spellbound is the, um, the code name of the CD32. The Amiga CD game system. And here's the Akiko chip I was talking about, which is the specialized chip which um, converts the Amiga bit plane graphics to the more traditional graphics where the color and the, the pixel information is stored in one uh, just one bit plane, which is the standard right now and uh, has been back in the days of the first PC 3D graphics and VGA and stuff like that. So I did remove the CD drive from this. It was just held in by four screws. I uh, can now see the dirt and grime on this thing here, which I will, of course, uh, put fresh oil on and uh, clean up because it looks really amazing with all the dead animals in there. Just wanted to show you something quickly which is how I, I um, attempt to clean all this, these crevices here which are very dirty and what I do is I use my Dremel for that and you might say oh what a Dremel are you crazy? Yes I am because I already tried that. You don't of course use the sandpaper uh, thing there, but this little brush and what you get is you get a little rotating brush and if you go in there 
you can perfectly clean these crevices if you take a look all the dirt is gone now you just wash that off same for these here could be that the brush is a bit too yeah no can't get in there these these are too deep but around here especially on these places here this works pretty good And of course, if you put some alcohol on this, this does it does even work better. Don't be too aggressive, just hold it slightly and it's best to angle it a little, because then it actually works pretty good. Now this looks much better than before, so that is all that counts. And you can, of course, take this alcohol off here it's just dirt. You have to go in. And just take this off. Oh. So since this is uh, very dark, you can't see the dirt immediately. And of course, I bring in my battle-proven baby wipes, which take off all the alcohol residue and shit. I think we are done with this, except for the grill up here. For that, I have this brush here, which came with, I don't know, some device. And I will just go and spray alcohol in here again and then brush like hell. Consider these grills cleaned. Nice. Okay, it's, it's not perfect. It has a few scratches but it looks almost new and that is pretty much what I was going for. Yeah, some scratches here. Let me pretty happy with this. So I can put the disk drive back in and we have that and this control thingy here. We have a few parts here, for example this black thing which goes onto this control here, the volume, I think it's a volume slider. Let me clean this and let's put some dioxide in here. dioxide and then this goes on here and that has to go in here and then you have to twist this to actually accommodate for the for the switch and I put it all the way there and this all the way there I have to try to keep this black thingy on while pushing down I think I did it first time that wasn't too hard. Let's see, it's attached. Yes, it is. Always remember to first screw out and then screw in so that the screw can find its original thread because there's no metal threading here. It's really just the plastic you screw into, like this. And that is the main controls reattached. So losing, loosening these screws actually makes this move better. Okay, we have that back in. Now for the CD drive. And that is in okayish condition. I will still clean it a little and clean the lens with a Q-tip and some alcohol. Oh yeah, that is actually a dirty lens. I don't know if you can see that. Oh, it's brownish. And by the way, this is a Shannon drive. CD-ROM drive this is a special drive just for the Amiga 32, CD32. It goes in like this. 
And it's best to open this up, I think, because then you can screw this in correctly and it looks good. And then you screw this down. This is a very tight fit with the screws. So I will put a bit of fresh grease on the rails. And I have this silicon grease here. Okay, that is the top half cleaned, looking good. Now I will go and I will actually wash the bottom half because it's really dirty. So the printer finished printing this back cover. It's surely better than not having one. Oh. You can file this down a little and at least it doesn't get dusty inside, which is good. I did go and dremel the rust off of this shielding here, mostly at least and clean this protective foil, which is nice. I still have to change all the caps. I did uh, check if I have all the caps and I'm missing da, 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 one value, which is 100 microfarad, 63 or 65 volts, the big ones here, which also look a bit dodgy. You can see this from the side. These are not straight. They are pretty crooked and that leads me to believe that there's some leakage going on. Did put some WD-40 into the switch. Also did wash the underside, which looks nice and shiny now. Did also try to remove the rust here. There's still a bit left there. I have to use some alcohol to get through this. And then I'm good to actually recap the board. But before I do that, I want to build a power supply to check if the board works right now. Just to give me a hint, if anything fails, that if that was my doing, recapping, or if that was uh, from the beginning. I have one of these connectors here, which is indeed the same as on the 5041-2. And that then goes in here, and that fits perfectly. We need 5 volts and 12 volts, and I have to build a cable for that. Or I have to check if the 1541-2 power supply actually works. But I don't trust these things on the internet, so I would have to find the service manual or at least the schematics for this board to check which pin is which, because I don't trust other people with trust issues. <laughs> Who figured? Okay, uh, let me check that and I'll be back. So I did check the voltages for the power supply and this 1541-2 power supply would just go up in flames if I connect it to this board if this was attached to a CD-ROM. It might work without the CD-ROM, but never mind. I found one of these Amiga power uh, sockets, which normally sit on your Amiga 500 or 1200, and uh, I found an Amiga power supply, which actually has 5 volts at 4.45 amps and 12 volts at 1 amp, which should be sufficient. And if I take this and plug this into this and then connect this to this, I have a power adapter and can use that. And it's actually a real Amiga power supply. So I will do just that. Just have to figure out this pin out here. I have to figure out the pin out. Uh, yeah, I did that pin out for the CD32 is if you are looking into the CD32 like this. That's a power connector and then you have plus 12 volt on the left side, left top, plus 5 on the right top and ground on the right bottom. Yeah, and now I have to figure out what voltages come out of this Amiga power supply and where, and then I can just connect them, which is pretty easy. Okay, I got the pin out for the connector, and um, if you look into the connector, you should have plus 12 volts up here, ground here, plus 5 there. I did connect my connector to the connector, and now I can just plug this in, switch it on, and take the multimeter and measure. And the top side is on the bottom, so we should have ground or 12 volts right here. So let's check. We have 
12 volts right there. And that means that ground is here and plus 12 is here. That's good. And we should have plus 5 right here. Yep, and we have 5 volts right here. Okay, very good. Okay, let me get soldering. I think that should be pretty straightforward. Did prepare some wire and some heat shrink tubing and my connector here and I think I'm good to go. I'll be back with a connector. So step one, I connected my colored cables. I have, if you have the connector down here, yellow here, which is 12 volts, black here on the right side, or on the right side, which is um, ground, and next to that, closer to the middle, but not in the middle, is 5 volts. And I will heat shrink this just put the heat shrink over it and then I have my connector on the power supply side and then I'm just going to connect those colors to my other connector over here. With the notch up here we have the red cable on the right side, the yellow cable on the left side and the black cable under the red which is ground. So 5 volts, 12 volts, ground. I have my, I have my heat shrink tubing here which goes over this I heat this and then I can put the connector back together and I have my adapter cable. Hopefully we will go and measure. So according to my calculations, <laughs> this, if I plug it in and switch it on, should show 5 volts. And it does. Nice. So let's do the same for the 12 volt. And let's see, should be 12 volts. And it is. Okay, knowing that, I can now go and finally finish this connector here. And then we can actually give this thing a test drive. But I don't want to kill the device, so better safe than sorry. Is it pretty? Nope. Will it work? Hopefully. Let's see. Okay, little disclaimer, uh, I have no CD-ROM attached. I'm using S-Video with this stupid converter here. No idea if this works, never tried S-Video with this. And we are using a self-made connector for the power supply. Let's switch on the power, which I did. It's on external, which should be the right one. And let's switch it on. And it's doing stuff. Question is, ah, it works. It actually works. Pictures flaky and all. It's very promising. Okay, I have no idea if the CD-ROM works because I didn't even take a look at it closely. Okay, good. So I will have to recap the board and I hope that the picture improves then. So now you can follow my instructions for building this adapter because it obviously works. Good. Yeah, next I will have to recap the board and I will have to wait for parts for that. So I will just do a jump cut and you will not see me recapping this. And I will put it back together in the case and we will see if it actually works with the CD-ROM. I, I think I have a CD somewhere, not a CD32 CD, but an Amiga CD. Let me try to find that and then we have that and then the controllers should come in and then we can really try it out. And another package came in and I finally have controllers, hopefully for the CD32 that work. I don't know yet. So I have uh, bought this bundle which set me back 95 euros shipped. All the stuff is really dirty. I have this uh, XE1SG which is the only real a card controller made specifically for the master system looks funky never seen one but i'll take it i have an atari controller with very rusty screws i have a sega saturn original sega saturn gun controller or light gun see and uh, the cable is 
pretty chewed, so I have to fix this. But that is not for the CD32. And finally, I have two controllers for the CD32, which is the infamous Honeybee controller. Allegedly the best controller there is for the CD32. And it's really dirty. And an original dog bone controller. I have no idea if it's called that. Also extremely dirty. And uh, yeah, this actually connects with a standard 9-pin DIN connector to the CD32 and it uses shifting to actually support all these buttons because the standard 9-pin normally only uses or supports a max of two buttons. At least on the Amiga, only one button on the C64 and the 8-bit machines. And this here has shoulder buttons and a start button and four, four buttons here. So, yeah, screws are a bit rusty. This has been opened, it seems. So we will check out this one first, open it up, clean it up, and then uh, take it from there and hopefully get the Honeybee controller working too. I did clean this controller completely, disassemble it, and uh, it had some issues that it auto-selected stuff and now it works again, which is good, but it's a horrible, horrible, horrible controller, really horrible. I thought people were exaggerating when they said this was a bad controller, but it is even worse than what they said, so yeah. Then I opened the Honeybee controller and it looks like some rodent made its nest in here. And this one is working really badly, so no wonder because there's all kinds of stuff in here. Yeah, so I will clean this. This should be interesting. And I think this will make for a good new controller. I already cleaned the back shell here, but it's still, still dirty. So this controller is very well loved. Let's say it like that. Let's disassemble this rat's nest here. Let's first take all the shoulder buttons. And this is pretty much con constructed like the the other um, controller does this uh, shifting with some LS logic up here and up here. Yeah, not much to see here. It's a bit more complicated than a, a standard 8-bit controller, which does not shift. Yeah, these buttons are dirty. These rubbers here, which make contact, and you can see that the contacts are also dirty. Take that out, and we have the main PCB, which is also very dirty. This is crazy dirty. <laughs> Look at that. Uh, yeah, and the control pad itself is beyond disgusting. Wow, that is. One shitty looking controller, and I've seen a lot of controllers, but that one is, this one takes a cake, easily. <laughs> wow, that is bad. That is really bad. And I think the buttons are kind of keyed, but not quite, so, yeah. Okay, so I think we will just drop all that shit on the table. Wow, it's really crazy dirty. Look at this. I will go and uh, wash this thoroughly because, well, it's dirty. Said that already. Okay, I've cleaned all the parts, including the top shell which is pretty scratched but it's clean now no dirt in the 
crevices here, which was pretty hard to brush. And uh, yeah, now I have to clean the PCB. I already did the D-pad. Now I'm just going to take I'm just going to take some IPA on a Q-tip and clean all the contacts. Did a swipe off the board already, but still there's stuff on there. Oh, that's wow! Never seen such a dirty PCB or contacts on a Joy-Con controller, Joypad controller. So now let's rebuild the controller, which is uh, fun. Okay, let's start by putting in all the buttons and stuff. And as I said, I cleaned everything. I have to check how this goes back together. We have three, two, one, right here. We have the yellow one right here. We have the green one next to the yellow one. And yeah, not much left to do like this. And there go these pads. And then we have these buttons here. I have no idea why this thing has so many buttons and switches. Who needs that, really? Let me check which buttons go there. Oh, these little gray ones, like this. Oh, man. Then we have one of these gray um, switches, like this, and one button which goes in like this and then we repeat the same and then we have two gray on top they only go in one way so that should be self-explanatory and we have the red one down here and the green one up here. And the blue blue one right here. Like this. And then we put that PCB back on. Oh yeah, I forgot. This comes after the PCB. PCB first, like this. Yeah, looks good. Strain relief. I have to put in these rubber domes for the shoulder buttons. These need these pins here. Like this. So let's finish this and put in this. This goes just down there. This is pressed on with this thing here because there are no more screws. So just put this back together. Let's close it up and let's see if it actually works. So somehow I managed to Lose a rubber dome. Okay, better. Okay, here it is, the, the honeybee controller. So let's plug this in and see if it works. Okay, I switched the input and now we can actually see the CD32, the controller and everything. And we put in Diggers and Oscar, which is a games compilation. Bought this for, I think, 15 euros. And have a few more here, which is mathematics for up to third grade. 
was in a bundle. Now games one and two. And this is shareware or PD, and that's all I have for now. I did try to burn CDs for this because there's no copy protection. I especially built a PC for that so that I had a, a CD burner that can actually burn in just double speed because most burners can only go down to 16 speed. But no luck, I burned through 13, uh, literally, I burned through about 13 um, discs and none of it worked. So, hmm. But I will keep trying because uh, in the Internet Archive there's all the there's a full library of CD32 games and these things are crazy expensive. So, well, some are, and I don't plan to buy more. So, yeah. So let's check out this Honeybee controller. I just inserted the disc, and if you close the lid, this is what you get. And there we go. And it's crazy how shitty a menu can be. So you can't use the D-pad here to select the game. You have to press the shoulder buttons. And I just noticed that the shoulder buttons have this up here. And they actually do on the original controller up here. If you can see that, they are not printed on. It's just some kind of... Uh, beveled plastic yeah and depending if you press the right or the left one you get diggers or oscar let's select oscar for now yeah and that actually selected the game and here we are press the red button to start or down for instructions we will skip the instructions by the way these buttons have colors which was not visible before i cleaned this it was just grime and dirt now you can see it's green, yellow, or orange, red, and blue. Let's press the red button and it actually works. Nice. I didn't find um, a controller test for this, so I have to use a game and hope for the best. Just start the game. And here we go. And you would expect that jumping is one of the buttons, but no, 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 no. It's just pushing up, which is crazy stupid. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight buttons, and you have to push the D-pad up to jump. Why? Why? I don't get it. It's the shittiest kind of control scheme there is. And you can see that uh, now, go in here or what? Hmm. So I can go in here, I think. Yeah, so it seems to work somehow, but it's far from being great. But these games just, just suck. If you have any suggestions for good CD32 games, just let me know. Um, Jens, the guy I bought, these three games from or discs from actually is going for a complete CD32 set. He lives in Cologne too, and I managed to find him um, via Kleinanzeigen, which is pretty much the German Craigslist. And uh, yeah, we met briefly, and he told me that he's going for a complete set. And he's missing a few of the more expensive titles, so good luck on that. The video is pretty flaky here. Uh, that is not the CD32. Not sure. Ah, okay. You have to press a button, which. Well, yeah, this kind of works, but not great. Let's let's try the other one. But I'm very happy that the CD32 actually works because, well, you would have to buy a new CD, ROM, or stuff like that, and yeah, I don't have to because. Let's try this again. And it does select, and oh, you have to press more than one time. Doesn't say that. User interface really sucks. Yeah, this pad is really beat up. But it's clean, which is a plus. Now, hands are completely destroyed from the alcohol. The 
So here you can select um, with the right mouse button or the blue button. Good blue button test. Yeah, works. And then you press the red one because you want to use the controller. And here you don't use the blue button to select, but you move the cursor. Good cursor test, so all directions seem to work. And you press the red button again. Why should there be one scheme of control? I mean, it's overrated. Okay, here we can choose our digger. You can go through all the pages here and check out the diggers. Not so many. Let's choose this one. Choose a zone. Okay, let's choose a zone from the map. Figured that much. I think this game is best played with a mouse. You're ready. Go now. Uh, go where? Exit. Okay, now what? Uh, exit. Hmm. For victory, six hundred is necessary. Okay. Post. Okay, there was this thing on here. Now what? Okay, menus pop up. Man, this is some shitty control. The buttons seem to work, which is good. And that is all that I needed to know. Okay, so, um, yeah, seems this thing completely works, which is nice. Even though the games suck, at least these two. So the CD32, I really struggle with saying CD32 because for me as a German, it's very hard to always pinpoint the TH in 32, CD32, but yeah, this is what it is. Um, it looks nice. It was a failed attempt of Commodore to actually get into the console market again after the CDTV. Um, I did recap this completely and uh, there are actually some units which were, were produced in a specific time um, which had some caps rotated and these caps bulge and then the CD drive doesn't load anymore. So if you get one, check if you have one of these um, consoles. I finally managed to actually burn some games and I did the classics Chaos Engine and Flink. And I have made these covers, uh, or I printed these covers, someone else made them. I link them in the description below so you can download them. And I even have these CD stickers, so these look legit now. Sometimes they load, sometimes they don't. I do not know what the secret is for, for burning them successfully. Sometimes it plays these discs and sometimes it doesn't. But you always have to use at, at max double speed, better single speed um, when burning and you have to use good um, CDR media because um, I'm using Philips right now which is obviously not good enough because it doesn't read all the time. I ordered gold plated discs, so these gold CDRs and I hope that these work better and I will do a short if, it, if these arrive and I can actually uh, attest to that. Yeah, so what is my final verdict on the CD32? I think it's totally okay that this failed because it's just not good. You're missing a disk drive, you're missing some way of input, um, like a keyboard, uh, if you don't have the specific keyboard for that, or an adapter. Um, if you go out or you went out in the 90s and bought this and brought this home and you had Amiga 500 games running from CD and most CDs that you can get for this are a meg or two megabytes uh, filled and the rest is blank. So 
that's not cool. Um, the CDTV at least had it was a fully fledged A500 um, without the drive, and you, but you could attach an external drive and had a DF0. This just has this black gaping hole, which I closed up with my 3D printed uh, cover. So this was my foray into the Amiga CD32, hard to pronounce still. Um, thanks for watching and if you have comments for good games or anything, if you have one, let me know what you think about it in the comments and I see you in 2024. Cheerio. Thank you for watching Retro is the New Black. If you are new to the channel, please like and subscribe. If you like the video, please share. Every like, share and comment helps a lot. Until next time, bye bye.